Welcome to this biomechanics video about muscle, where we're, we'll be talking about whole muscle force generation. We're going to start out by considering the force length curve for a sarcomere. Down at the bottom you can see the actin and myosin cross bridges, and then there's a graph of force and length that will have this little green bead that moves along it as the muscle contracts. So I'm going to go ahead and play this. and. I want you to watch how the overlapping portion of the actin and myosin filaments determine the level of contraction in the muscle. At the optimal fiber length, right here in this plateau region, the muscle can generate a maximum amount of force. At any length beyond that, on either side, the amount of force decreases either due to the too much overlap between the actin and myosin or suboptimal overlap between the actin and myosin. We have different names. Muscles can, the actin and myosin filaments can move either direction. They can, they can move out away from neutral or they can move towards neutral as we just saw. And we have different names for that. So in this image right here, there's a resting actin myosin filament. If the muscle filament is shortening, then the, we call that a concentric contraction. If the sarcomere is staying the same length during the contraction, we call that an isometric contraction. Uh, so there's no length change. If the sarcomere is lengthening, we call that an eccentric contraction. So an example of this would be when you uh, let down your arm during a biceps curl. An example of an isometric contraction would be holding your arm flexed, holding a dumbbell um, for a biceps curl. And then finally, an isokinetic Contraction is a uh, contraction where the contraction is the same speed. So there's a constant speed during either shortening or lengthening. The shape of the force length curve is determined by the amount of overlap between the actin and myosin filaments. So in region A, up here at the top, there's optimum overlap and there's max, consequently maximum force generation. Over on this side, there's few binding sites available, so um, you get less force. And down here at C, at the very bottom, there's no binding sites available, so you get no force. Similarly, on the D side, because of overlap, there's no uh, binary, there's fewer binding sites available down to no binding sites available. So you get less force. This region of optimal sarcomere length, uh, is based on the type of animal, is, is different depending on the different types of animals. So uh, here's a table of some different species and I want you to note the different, the similar thick filament lengths for most species. Most species have about 1.6 microns for their thick filament length, but then the thin filament length varies and as a result the optimal sarcomere length also varies. So. For example, here's a chicken. The optimal, optimal sarcomere length is 2.08 microns. And here's a human. The optimal sarcomere length is 2.64 microns. It's actually the longest optimal sarcomere length on this table for humans. So you can see that and hummingbirds have the shortest optimal sarcomere length. So that's a useful thing to consider because, oh, and this is considered so humans are 2.64, the longest sarcomere length on the table. This is considered to be constant across skeletal muscles in the human body. This is an important thing to note how long the optimal sarcomere length is because fibers, muscle fibers, are composed of sarcomeres in series. So if you know the length of your muscle fibers and you, you can determine the number of sarcomeres you have in series if you know the optimal fiber length. So that 2.64 optimal sarcomere length for humans. So in this equation, L0F is your optimal fiber length, optimal muscle fiber length. L0S is your optimal sarcomere length, that value we just looked at at the table, and N is the number of sarcomeres in series that you need in order to get your optimal muscle fiber length. In short, more sarcomeres lead to longer optimal strength. Muscles generate force both actively and passively. So actively is when you're doing a muscle contraction. For example, a biceps curl, that's an active uh, force generation. Muscles can also generate force passively when they're lengthened. So an example of this would be someone um, 
taking your arm and pushing your arm down, the force that is generated in your muscle as they passively stretch your muscle um, is passive force generation. But muscles are much better, as you can see from this graph, at producing force actively than they are at producing force passively. So now, let's think a little bit about the force length curve. And let's consider two different muscles. Muscle A has an optimal fiber length of four centimeters, and muscle B has an optimal fiber length of 10 centimeters. So I want you to think for just a minute, how many sarcomeres in series does each fiber have? Assuming 2.6 microns for the fiber length. So to figure this out, you just think about the fiber length and you divide the fiber length by the optimal sarcomere length, 2.6 microns, to get your answer. So for the four centimeter long muscle, um, that's 15,385 sarcomeres, or, uh, and for the 10 centimeter muscle, uh, that's 38,462 sarcomeres. So, then what does the curve look like for the force length for each of these two muscles? So the shorter muscle is going to be centered around four because it's a force, its optimal length is four centimeters. And the longer muscle is going to be centered around 10 because its length is 10 centimeters, optimal length. But then the muscles are going to have different widths of force length curves. So the longer muscle is going to be able to exert force over a larger excursion. But each time for each muscle, uh, the excursion that the muscle can make is half of its optimal length to 1.5 times its optimal length. And if you think about the actin myosin head overlap and the optimal definition of optimal length, that should make sense. It can extend all the way to no overlap and it can contract all the way to complete overlap. So uh, that gives you a sense of where you get the range on the muscle of muscle length on the force length curve. As we consider muscles, we also think about the physiological cross-sectional area because that's related to strength. So physiologic cross-sectional area is something that a parameter that we use to describe muscles because muscles actually change their area over the length of the muscle. They're often very narrow near the tendon where they insert at the muscle and then they get wider through the muscle belly and then get narrower again or some of them get stay wide um, depending on how they insert on the other end of the muscle. So physiological cross-sectional area is defined as the volume of the muscle divided by the length, the optimal length of the muscle. So for maximum and, and muscles have a maximum isometric stress in active muscle, active extension or contraction of 30 newtons per centimeter squared, approximately. So the maximum isometric force that a muscle can, uh, can generate is the physiological cross-sectional area, denoted here as A, times that maximum isometric stress. Physiological cross-sectional area can be a tricky concept to wrap your head around, so let's consider a given volume of muscle tissue. Down on the right, I have two different situations. I have a short fiber length and a wide cross-sectional area, and there's a long fiber length and a relatively narrow cross-sectional area. In both of these cases, the fiber length times the cross-sectional area is equal. So we have a constant volume. What that really means is that I have some volume of the muscle, Vm, and it's equal to the physiological cross-sectional area divided by, or times, I'm sorry, physiological cross-sectional area times the optimal length of the muscle. So for the muscle with the shorter fibers, that muscle is capable of small excursions, while the muscle on the right with the longer fibers is capable of much larger excursions. Similarly, if we think about the force, you can see the two different force curves here. L2 has a larger excursion as we just saw on the previous slide because it has longer fibers, but F1 has a much greater maximum force that it can reach because there's more fibers. So a large cross-sectional area lends itself to large force, whereas a small cross-sectional area lends itself, to sm lar lends itself to small force. The moral of the story here is that given a constant muscle volume, you can't have both a large force and a big range of motion. You get one or you get the other. Now there are ways to optimize muscle force within a small volume. The muscle that we were just looking at 
has a pination, which is the arrangement of the fibers relative to the axis of force generation. The muscle we were just looking at has a longitudinal pination. The fibers are aligned along the axis of force generation. And an example of this is the biceps muscle. Some muscles are called pennate muscles, where the fibers are oriented at an angle to the axis of force generation. So the vastus lateralis and the gluteus medius are both examples of this. And then there are muscles that are multipennate, where they have multiple angles of fibers relative to the axis of force generation. In general, we define the pennation angle as the angle between the tendon line of pull and the fibers, and we call that alpha. And so you can estimate the tendon force um, by relating the muscle force and the angle, Fm times the cosine of alpha. There are a variety of different pennation angles that show up in the human body and, and in animals, mammals. And there's parallel fibers, there's unipennate fibers, there's bipennate muscles, there's unipennate um, with non-uniform fiber lengths, and then there's multipennate muscles. The advantage of pennation is that it amplifies muscle strength in a limited anatomical space, but it does limit the length of contraction. So it takes away from the range of motion that you can have with that muscle. Uh, fusiform muscles are muscles with fibers parallel to the tendon and alpha equals zero for those. And pennate muscles are any muscles where the pennation angle is greater than zero. Here's a list of some of the muscles in the lower extremity. And you can see as you look through these that the you, they're varying physiological cross-sectional areas right here, their length of the muscle, their length of the tendon, and their pennation angle. So many of the muscles in the lower leg, most of the muscles in the lower leg have a pennation angle of about five. So pennate muscles have low fiber length to muscle length ratios and are really good for force production. Longitudinal muscles have higher fiber to muscle length ratios and are good for large excursions and large velocities. Let's quantify the force generated at the tendon for a bipennate muscle. So on the right is a simplified view or model of a bipennate muscle. And you can see on the side view that this is really just two parallelograms next to each other. So we're gonna model it that way. So if we wanna determine the force generated at the tendon, Okay, so the force the muscle generates at the tendon. Now the first thing we're gonna consider is what's the physiological cross-sectional area for this muscle? And we're gonna use geometry to do that. So the area of the two parallelograms is two times A, the width of the parallelograms, times B, the height of the parallelograms. And you can go and verify that that's a formula for an area of a par parallelogram. And then there's the volume of the parallelogram, which is just the area times the width. They're really, we're modeling them as kind of these parallelogram boxes. Um, so the width of the muscle. To find the physiological cross-sectional area, that was just the area of the parallelogram. The physiological cross-sectional area for the muscle is the volume divided by the optimal length, L0. The optimal length is the optimal fiber length, which is calculated as the length of, uh, the width of the fiber divided by the sine of the angle theta, the pennate angle there. And then we can use that to estimate the physiological cross-sectional area for our fiber. So two times B times the width times the sine of theta. But that just gets us the physiological cross-sectional area. In order to determine the force of the tendon, we need to think about the force in the fibers and then back that out to the tendon. So the force in the fiber is the physiological cross-sectional area times the stress. It's the definition of stress. Stress is force over area. And the stress in a muscle is 30 newtons per square centimeter, give or take. So we're gonna go ahead and use that assumption. And then from there, once we've calculated the force in the fiber, we can go ahead and calculate the force in the tendon by thinking about the pennate angle and the direction of the force vectors. So it's a pretty straightforward process as long as you think through and step through the geometry. And just remember that the stress in the muscle is 30 newtons per square centimeter. The velocity of muscles affects those related to the ability of muscle to create force too. So I'm gonna watch this video. I want you to observe what happens as the muscle over on the test apparatus on the left is stretched and compressed. And you can see how it changes as it's stretched and compressed. 
And as the muscle force reduces substantially when the fibers are shortening, so during the time when the fibers are shortening, the muscle over here, the muscle fibers, um, the force is reduced substantially. Their maximum contraction velocity occurs when at the middle here, where there is no force to being developed okay, across this jump. And then muscle force is enhanced when the fibers are lengthening. So muscles are actually better at generating force when they're getting longer. So maximum force is achievable only during lengthening, and it's really actually nearly twice as much as uh, the force available for an isometric contraction. An isometric contraction is one where the muscle is keeping a constant length. You can model this curve, because it's a, typically described as a hyperbolic relationship using the math shown here, where um, the maximum isometric force is related to the maximum contraction velocity and the current contraction velocity and the current force. Um, typically the maximum contraction velocity is somewhere between 2 to 10 fiber lengths per second. It's about as fast as a muscle can go. And force or fiber length and orientation affect velocity. So muscle A has very long fibers. Muscle B has short fibers because it's a pennate muscle and therefore is capable of generating more force but more s slowly. So if you think about the assume that these two muscles have the same volume you can think about labeling the force velocity curves here the lower the long fibers and the small physiological cross-sectional area has a very different shape of curve than the short fibers the large physiological cross-sectional area the muscle so we're talking about absolute change in length per unit time a single sarcomere can only contract a certain amount in a given time if you have two sarcomeres in series, you can shorten twice that amount in the same amount of time. It's an important thing to remember. Finally, we're going to talk about muscle power. Power is equal to force times velocity. You might remember that definition from physics. So if we think about that force velocity curve that we were just looking at, we can overlay that with a mechanical power output. So thinking about just the shortening side of the curve here on the right, you can see the, um, the mechanical power output is zero when the velocity is highest because the force is zero and is a zero again when the velocity is zero and the force is greatest. You can't maximize both force and velocity simultaneously because they peak under different conditions. The maximum power occurs at about a third of the maximum shortening uh, contraction velocity for contraction. So thinking about this curve and trying to get an understanding intuitively of what it's going on uh, consider, for example, this curve and think about bicycling in a gear that's too high, i.e. you have a low gear ratio. So you have big gear in the front, big gear in the back, low gear ratio. You're going to pedal very, very, very fast and you're not going to generate a whole lot of force. So in that situation, you're going to have a high velocity. You're going to be far to the right on the velocity axis, but you're going to be very close to zero on the force generation axis. If you were to consider a gear that's too low, i.e. a high gear ratio, so you've got a very small gear on the front and a larger gear on the back, you, you're going to be in the high force generation region, but you're not pedaling anywhere. So on that note, bring your questions to class. I'll see you there.